Thank you so much. Um, I had to think about it for a second. I was like, I think, I, I think I've been at CBC for 20 years, give or take a few years. <laughs> um, but like Pedro said, my name is Jarmy. It's good to, to be here. I bring you greetings from Community Bible Church. Uh, from what I remember, I think you had Dan Orsilla here uh, last month, and so I get the privilege to be here. Um, go ahead and turn your Bibles. We'll be in Isaiah chapter 6, and uh, while you're turning there, I want to just give a little bit of a brief intro here. Um, I was born and raised in Hawaii, uh, and then for some odd reason decided to move to California uh, when I was about 15 years old. Uh, upon moving here, I began attending Community Bible Church. I got saved halfway through my senior year. Uh, I've had the opportunity to serve in our children's ministry for about 14 years before I stepped down, and now I'm currently serving in our youth ministry. I've been serving there for 15 years, and I also serve in our adult ministry where I uh, get to teach in our Sunday school, and um, I actually am one of the interns also at one of our home fellowship groups. And so, aside from that, I am a recent graduate of Cornerstone Bible College. I've got my bachelor's in biblical studies. Um, I apparently am a glutton for punishment, and I think it's because I have yet to have Tony Sinelli as my professor, so I decided to go for my Master's of Divinity, same at Cornerstone. And uh, the hope is that I will one day be sent out as a missionary, uh, specifically to Japan. That is what my church is currently preparing me for. And so I say all this because I wanted to start this off with a simple question to each of you. And that question is, how would you describe yourself? Or how would you describe me, having most of you just met me? In fact, uh, when I actually was in Japan in December, the first thing that everyone said when they described me was, you have really cool hair. <laughs> so maybe, I don't know if that's what you thought. <laughs> but how would you describe, I mean, you've gotten a brief intro from me, so you might know some things. You might focus on a, appearance or just the things that I've done. Now, I say that because my next question to you is, well, how would you describe God? How would you describe God? And though there are many passages in the Bible that we can turn to that describe just giving us a picture of God, I believe the one passage that really gives a clear picture of God is Isaiah 6, where God is described as holy, holy, holy. So I've titled this sermon, Behold Your God. Very simple. I want my desires that you would behold God the splendor and majesty of God. And looking at Isaiah 6, we will see three things about the holiness of God. First, what it means to have a right view of the holiness of God. Second, what it takes for you to approach a holy God. And third, how you are to respond with a life of holiness that worships God out of reverential fear, one that remembers your mission and one that lives out a life of holiness. And so as I've had given you some questions, my question for you to consider as we go through this passage is simply this. How do you see God? How do you see God? So let me read our passage, Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 8. And it reads, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out, while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven." Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, 
whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then I said, here am I, send me. As I said, our pa- in our passage, we're going to be, I want you to behold your God. And so my first point, if you've gotten notes, your first, my first point is that you would behold the holiness of God on full display. Behold the holiness of God on full display. Here in this passage, we're told God is holy, holy, holy. And if you're to ask the question, well, what does holy mean? What does that word mean? How would you define it? If you were to look into that, the word holy would simply mean pure, clean, free from defilement of crimes, idolatry, and other unclean or profane things. Yet, I ask you, is that all there is to say about what it means to be holy? Is that enough to describe what it means when, we, when the Bible says that God is holy? Is that enough? I would say no, that is not enough. In fact, I would agree with A.W. Tozer. A.W. Tozer said this. He said, we cannot grasp the true meaning of the divine holiness by thinking of someone or something very pure and then raising the concept to the highest degree we are capable of. God's holiness is not simply the best we know, infinitely better. We know nothing like the divine holiness. It stands apart unique, unapproachable, incomprehensible, and unattainable. What Tozer is getting at here is that you and I cannot fully comprehend what it means when it says that God is holy. Why? Why can we not? It's because God is holy and we are not. How can someone who is not holy understand another who is perfectly holy? We are fallen creatures, full of sin, and yet, in his word, we are given a glimpse of what it means when God is holy. We're given a glimpse. And so, here we're going to see five ways that Isaiah 6 shows that God is holy. Five ways. First, that God is holy in sovereignty. In verse 1, in verse 1, it says that we we see God is sovereign over all. It says that in the year of of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted with the train of his robe filling the temple. To get the context here, you would need to read 2 Corinthians 26 to really understand, well, who is King Uzziah? King Uzziah was a king over Judah. He was a king over Judah for 52 years, and if you were to read the passage, it says that he did right in the eyes of the Lord. He did right in the sight of God, and he brought about a time of wealth, prosperity to Judah. And yet in the midst of all this, all this amazing things that Uzziah did, what we see is that he is also not perfect. He's not pure like God. In fact, later in 2 Chronicles 26, verse 16, it says this. It says, but when he became strong, his heart was so proud that he acted corruptly, and he was unfaithful to the Lord his God, for he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. In fact, the result of that is that it led to him having leprosy. He was seen as unclean to the end of his days, to the day he died. And so, despite all the amazing things Uzziah did, the Bible makes it clear he's not perfect. He's not pure. He's not like God, who is holy. And so here in Isaiah 6, it says, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. Notice what Isaiah says here. He says, I saw the Lord. That word for Lord here is the word Adonai. In fact, if you were to translate Adonai, it just simply means my Lord. It carries the meaning of Lord, Master, King, the one who holds authority. And so when it says that God is Adonai, what it's saying is that he is, it's its, it's, its title. He is the supreme sovereign king over all. Judah might have lost a great king, 
Judah might be in a a hopeless state, wondering what's going to happen next. We've had this king for 50 plus years, and he's dead now. They might be in a hopeless state. They may have lost a great king. Yet what's clear is that God, the Lord, is holy, the perfect sovereign Lord and king who is still on the throne. He is still seated over all. As one commentator put it, he said, a great king may have left his throne on earth, but the greatest king was still seated on the throne of heaven. Nothing changes the fact that God is the holy sovereign king, infinitely higher, infinitely greater than any king on earth. And so he is holy in sovereignty, yet he's also holy in appearance. In verse 2, Verse 2, it says that the seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. Now, here we have the seraphim entering the picture, these majestic beings. And so we want to know, well, who are the seraphim? Who are these creatures? The seraphim, they are angels. They are angels, and they are truly a sight to behold. In fact, if you were to define what a seraphim are, the word seraphim simply means burning ones. And so when you look at seraphim, what you see is that these are creatures who burn bright. They shine bright with light. They were glorious creatures, splendor, really, to behold upon. And yet, what are these creatures doing? What are the seraphim doing? The seraphim says that they are covering. They are covering his face. Two, he's covering his feet. And with two, he's flying. In the midst of their, in how great the, the seraphim are, what they are showing is that nothing compares to God. Though they are shining bright with a light that, that is amazing, God shines far greater than them, so great that they can't even look at him. The seraphim can't even behold and look upon God. And so, dear friends, just let that sink in for a moment. The seraphim cannot look at God, these majestic creatures. So if the seraphim cannot even look at God, what makes you think any other created being could look at God, can behold God? No one can. And so God is holy in his appearance. He is set apart. Yet not only that, but he is holy in nature. He's holy in nature in verse 3. And it says, And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And though we, we can spend a lot of time focusing on what it means when it says that he is holy, 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 there is a small word that I want you to look at to really consider. And that small word is holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. In other words, holiness is not just a part of God. It's not just some small part of of him. No, holiness is what God is. He is holy. It's his nature, his essence. One of my favorite movies, some of you might have seen it, it's The Princess Bride. And in The Princess Bride, you know, you have Wesley, he, he I might be giving spoilers, but Wesley, you know, he's, he's dead, and they bring him to Miracle Max, and they say, well, he's dead, and what does Miracle Max say? He says, no, he's only mostly dead. He's only mostly dead, so I can, I can, I can heal him. God isn't mostly holy. He's not mostly holy. He is holy. That's what he is. It's his nature. No other attribute of God is repeated three times as the holiness of God. You do not see in the Bible, you can read it from front to back. You will never see the Bible say that God is love, love, love. God is mercy, mercy, mercy. God is grace, grace, grace. You will never see any of that said of him. And yet here, what we see is He is holy, holy, holy. God and God alone is holy. 
Again, to quote Tozer, Tozer says, Holy is the way God is. To be holy, he does not conform to a standard. He is the standard. He is absolutely holy with an infinite, incomprehensible fullness of purity that is incapable of being other than it is. God is holy. Fourth, God is holy in power. He is holy in power. Look at what the seraphim are saying here. Seraphim, they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. They use a, a specific title of God here. They say he is the Lord of hosts. In fact, at verse 1, it says, I saw the Lord. And that word there is Adonai. He is the sovereign Lord over all. Yet here, seraphim do not use the same word. They do not say, holy, holy, holy is Adonai. No, 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 they don't say that. In fact, they use a different word. They say Yahweh Sabaoth. He is the Lord of hosts. One Bible translation that says, He is the Lord of heaven's armies. He is the Lord of all of heaven. And so you think about seraphim. You think about the cherubim. You think about the angels. You think about any of those. God is far greater than all of them. In fact, God is the one that he is in, has all power, so he commands them. He is the one who commands all of heaven's armies. There is no one who is greater in power, greater in authority than God, the Lord of hosts. And finally, what we see is that God is holy in glory. He's holy in glory. At the end of verse 3, it says, The whole earth is full of his glory. Or the literal translation of this, this section, it would be, the fullness of all the earth is his glory. The fullness of all the earth is his glory. And again, let that sink in for a moment. You think about a passage like where it says in Psalm 19, verse 1, it says, the heavens are, are telling of the glory of God. And so it's one thing to think that the heavens declare the glory of God. Here he's saying that the entire earth, all that it contains, all of creation is telling of his glory. It's telling of his glory. In other words, anywhere and everywhere you look, everywhere you look, anywhere you go, it all points to how glorious and majestic God is in holy splendor. If I could quote John Piper, John Piper, he says, God's holiness is the incomparable perfection of his divine nature. His glory is the display of that holiness. And so when you see that the Bible says that he is holy, 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 that the heavens and earth declare of his glory, what you see is that God is holy. Look to creation. Look to the heavens and earth. You will see how holy God is. Look to his word. Read the word, and what you will see is God is holy. He is, is holy and, and moral spot, morally spotless. He is perfect in character. Everything that God does is holy. And so you look at his word, and what you will see is you will see a God who is high and lifted up infinitely holy. He is the sovereign king in whom no one can look upon his face and live. Now, imagine for a second, you are Isaiah. You're Isaiah in this moment. You are seeing all this. You're seeing the holy sovereign king seated on the throne, the one who has all authority and power, the one who is so holy and that his glory is far greater than all the heavens and earth can contain. You're seeing the Lord. You're seeing this picture, this perfect display of God's holiness. And yet, in the midst of this perfect display, there is one thing wrong here. Did you catch what's wrong here? There's only one thing wrong. And that one thing that's wrong in this picture is the fact that Isaiah is there. 
Isaiah is there and looking at this. He is the one thing that's wrong here. In fact, what you see in his response, his response makes that, makes that very clear. It's a response of great fear and terror. Terror of the one glorious king who is seated on the throne. Fear of the burning ones, the seraphim, whose mighty voice can shake the foundation. Great fear of the smoke that's filling the temple. A picture of the great clouds of darkness that would come when God would bring about judgment. Judgment on those who are disobedient to him. And so again, you are Isaiah. You were seeing this. In fact, Isaiah, you think about who Isaiah is. He is probably the most upright and righteous person on the earth right now. He's the prophet of Israel. He's the prophet. He's probably the most godly in all of Judah. So how does he respond? Does he say, does he say to God, God, Lord, you did good in bringing me before you. I am the most upright, the most righteous and godly of all people in all this nation. So if anyone, if anyone here deserves to be in your presence, it's me. Is that what he says? No. No, we can read what he says. You don't see any of that. He responds with a curse. He actually declares a curse upon himself. Did you catch that? Look at what he says. Verse 5. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined. He says, I am ruined. I'm undone. I am completely and utterly lost and cut off. Why? Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Wait a minute. Isaiah, you're the prophet. You're the one that actually goes to the people and says, thus says the Lord. You're the one that brings God's word to the people. And you're telling me that you're, you have unclean lips. That I am ruined because I have unclean lips. That, that should grip you. In fact, you think about what Christ himself says in Matthew 12, 34. He said, for the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. And so what Isaiah is really getting at, it's not just simply what he's saying, that, and that's what's making him unclean. He's saying, no, because it comes from within me. He's saying, I am unclean from my very being, from who I am in inwardly. I am undone. And that curse that he pronounces is because of what he says after that. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I've seen the King. I've seen the Lord. And what that shows to Isaiah, he says, he's realizing, I'm a sinner. I am a, a sinner completely. In fact, you, if you think about, think about what God said to Moses in Exodus, Exodus 33, verse 20. He, Moses says to God, show me your glory. I want to see your glory, Lord. I want to see it. What did God say? God said, you cannot see my face, for no man can see my face and live. So it is only right it is only right that Isaiah would declare a curse upon himself, that Isaiah would be in, in complete despair. He is seeing how sinful he is, and he is seeing how holy God is. If I can quote R.C. Sproul, R.C. Sproul says, for the first time in his life, Isaiah really understood who God was. At the same time, for the first time, Isaiah really understood who Isaiah was. Dear friends, if there is one thing that must be realized when you even consider God's holiness, it is this. 
that you are not qualified to come before and look upon God. Only someone who is perfect without sin can come before God. And therefore, to go back to the problem of Isaiah, the problem of Isaiah is the same problem you and I have today. We are not qualified to come before a holy God. We are not qualified. We are the problem. We are not holy. We are completely unclean before God's eyes. And therefore, like Isaiah, your response should be one of fear, should be one of great terror. Having true fear of God and His holiness is not something just that unbelievers have. It's not just an unbeliever that should be feeling fear and terror before God. It's everyone. All believers, all people should have great fear and terror when they look upon God. In fact, if you were to read any account of people who come before God, what do you see that happens? Take Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel looks at God, and what does it say? He fell on his face. Peter, James, John, they are up in the mountain with Christ in the transfiguration, and they hear the voice of the Father. They're beholding the majestic glory of Christ, and what does it say? They fell on their face, and they were terrified. In fact, you read in Revelation, the apostle John, the one who is titled the disciple whom Jesus loved, even he, when he beholds Christ, even he would fall at the Lord's feet like a dead man. Notice who's falling at their feet. Notice who's falling on the ground. They're crying out in fear. This is the right response when you consider God's holiness. And so I ask you again, how do you see God? How do you see Him? Now, if I were to stop this sermon here and say, let us pray and send you off on your way, leaving you on this thought of God is holy and you're not qualified to come before God, you should be in great fear of God. If I ended it here, many of you would probably be discouraged. And so praise God that Isaiah doesn't end on verse 5. There is verse 6 and 7. And so first, my prayer was that you would behold the holiness of God on full display. Second, behold the holiness of God in perfect action. Spending all this time on looking at why God is holy, how he is morally and perfectly spotless in his nature and all he does, what this shows is that not only is he holy in splendor, but everything that God does is holy. Everything he does is righteous. And so it's amazing to see verse 6 and 7 here. This is amazing. It says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, from, and your sin is forgiven. Knowing that Isaiah is unclean and unworthy to stand in the presence of God, what does God do? God provides the means so that Isaiah can stand before him, so that Isaiah can be in his presence. God provides that means. And how does he do it? He says he, he sends one of the seraphim, a seraphim with a burning coal to purify Isaiah by removing his sin. The NASB, it says, your sin is forgiven. Other translations, it says, your sin is atoned for. It's atoned for. Your sin has been covered. And now think about it. Did Isaiah do anything to earn this atonement? Did he do anything for it? No, he didn't. He didn't, earn, he didn't do anything to earn forgiveness for his sins. He did absolutely nothing. 
So how was Isaiah purified so that he could stand before the holy and righteous God? Something was given to him to atone for, to cover his sin so that he can stand before God. Dear friends, does that sound familiar to you? Does it sound familiar? Do you see something like that happening in the New Testament? Yes, you do. You see the exact same thing happening in the Father sending His Son, sending His only begotten Son, Christ, to be the atonement for your sin, to be the cover for your sin. A.W. Pink, he says, God's holiness is manifested at the cross. Wondrously and yet so, most solemnly does the atonement display God's infinite holiness and abhorrence of sin. How hateful must sin be to God for him to punish it to its utmost when it was imputed to his son. Dear friends, when Christ came to live that perfect, obedient life to the Father and die on the cross for sinners, that punishment for your sin was credited to him. And his righteousness, his perfect righteousness was credited to you so that you can now come before God. And why does this matter? Why does it matter that Christ's righteousness was credited to you? It matters because it's the only way you can stand before God. It's the only way you can look and see and come before God. J.C. Ryle wrote, Wherewith can any mortal man come before God? What can we bring as a plea for acquittal before that glorious being in whose eyes the very heavens are not clean? We must come in the name of Jesus, standing on no other ground, pleading no other plea than this, Christ died on the cross for the ungodly, and I trust in him. Christ died for me, and I believe on him. That is the only way you can stand before God. Through Christ, you who are unholy, unqualified, and unclean can now be seen as righteous. Through Christ, you can now boldly approach the throne. Not a throne of wrath, not a throne of judgment. You can approach a throne of grace. You can come before God now, you can approach him like a child does his own father. So you can come before God now. And so I ask you again, who is God to you? How do you see him? And finally, in my third point, that you would live a life that reflects the holiness of God. In fact, it's not enough to have all this information, to know about God's holiness, to know about Christ's righteousness in the gospel. It's not enough to just simply know about it. Really, the question is, well, what do we do from here? What should our response be? And though there is much that I can say, much that we can glean from here, there's really just three things that I hope to have you see in our passage that you would apply today. And the first is that you would see the believer's life of godly fear. The believer's life of godly fear. Mentioned, I have mentioned it earlier, when you behold the holiness and glory of God, the immediate response is fear. And through, through the righteousness of Christ, when it's credited to you, you can now come to God with boldness. Does that mean then that you are to live a life that has no fear of God? No, we, we, have, we are to live a life that, that does have a reverential fear of God. We have a reverence towards God. And notice that is what the seraphim are doing. The seraphim, what are they doing? They are worshiping him. These majestic creatures are worshiping God. They have a fear of God 
and a reverence of God. They are the ones crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. You would see the exact same thing at the end in Revelation in chapter 4, where the angels are crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. In fact, we read in Revelation 5, what you will see is that all of heaven, all creatures are going to worship God. And so part of your life, part of how you live today is that you are to live a life that worships God, that has a reverence towards God, that realizes God is holy and I want to worship him in the right way. I want to worship him in fearful reverence now. And brothers and sisters, I say this to you because having a high view of God, of who God is, and daily reminding yourself of how holy and glorious God is, that will then show you just how great the price was paid by Christ so that you could be holy and righteous before God. And when you have a high view of Christ, of what he did for you, your response is, I cannot help but worship. I cannot help but worship Christ for what he's done. And so ask yourself, ask yourselves, does your life in everything you do, whether it be on Sunday or at Monday or on Friday, does your life reflect a life of all, all filled worship? of God's holiness? Are you full of awe of who God is? And yet again, does the fear of God only mean reverence to God, though? Does it only mean reverence, respect to God? Again, I would say no, not at all. Even as a Christian, there must still be a sense of fear, of fear, of terror towards God. And so secondly, the believer's life of holy living. Having his sins forgiven and having been set apart for the work that the Lord has for him. If you were to read the rest of Isaiah, what do you see Isaiah doing? You would see Isaiah is doing exactly what God commands him to do. He obeys God. He listens to God. He's living a life of obedience to all that God commands him. Is the same true for you? If you were to read like, say, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14 to 16, it says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If you were to read 1 Peter, what you would see as the command is that you are to be holy. Be holy in all your behavior. How is it done? It's done by not being conformed to your former lusts and what was yours in your ignorance. And so what he's saying is you're to put off being conformed to what your sinful nature was once pursuing and you're to put on holiness, holy living, And what does that command look like? If you you read verse 17 in 1 Peter 1, it says, if you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during this time of your stay on earth. What does holy living look like? It looks like conducting yourself in fear while you're on your stay on earth. Think for a moment of a child. You have a little child, You think about them. A child loves their father. You know, a child would run up to, maybe run to their dad when their dad comes home and give him a hug. A child loves their father. But at the same time, a child will have a right fear of their father to not displease their dad. Growing up, uh, I had only one time, only once was I ever disciplined by my dad where he, I I don't know what I did, but I just remember seeing him pull the belt off, you know, put it together, and just one time, whack. 
I remember that. I don't, again, I don't know what it was, but he, even though he came later, he said, he apologized and he told me that it's, I love you and this is why I disciplined you. There was one thing that went through my mind at that moment and for years later, and that one thing was, I don't ever want to talk back to my dad. I don't ever want to disobey him because that's what's going to happen again. There was a fear of displeasing my dad so that I would not be punished for it. And in the same way, but in an even greater way, dear Christian, there must be a fear of displeasing God, this holy God, in how you live for him. There is a fear. If I can quote the Puritan Thomas Watson, he said, the godly fear and sin not. The wicked sin and fear not. Now, I say that because how great God is in your eyes will greatly affect how you live for him. And again, the problem, though, is we don't oftentimes see God as great, as high and lifted up. We don't oftentimes see him this way. Because if I saw God as holy as he truly is, if I saw him, then my life would reflect that. I would not live a life that's simply reactive to sin. Reactive in that, you know, I'm just going to do my own thing, and then when sin pops up, I'm, I get surprised. And then I think, oh, I need to fight back against sin, but then maybe I I've fall into temptation, and then I just give in to sin. Being reactive would be, well, I can just give in to sin then, and you know what, God will forgive me. You know, if I confess my sin, his grace will cover even this sin. And so you nonchalantly think that way. And though it is true that God's grace abounds over sin, that life would be a life that thinks very lowly of God. But if God is holy, 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 then my life it's not simply a life of reaction to sin. My life, if God is holy, my life will be a life that's proactive against sin. That's proactive. It's not just a life that when it, it comes close to sin, seeing how close can I get to that temptation and then back away. My life is, I'm not even going to go near it. I'm going to proactively go away from that sin. I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to flee sin and temptation. I'm going to fight when it comes. I'm going to be ready for it. And this is what drove the early church, brothers and sisters. Early church, you have men like John Chrysostom who said, it is more bitter to sin against Christ than to suffer the torments of hell. Or Anselm of Canterbury, he wrote this. He said, if sin were on one side and hell on the other side, I would rather leap into hell than willingly sin against God. That is a life that has a right view of God, a right view of his holiness, and a right view of sin. Brothers and sisters, a right view of God will produce a right view of sin. And a right view of sin will produce a right view, an attitude of holy living. This is an attitude that sees sin with the same hatred that God has against it. And so, I ask you, how are you living your life? Are you living a life that's holy, that's actively fighting against sin, that's actively fleeing from sin, that's not going close to it. And now finally, my third application is that you would see the believer's life of purposeful mission. The believer's life of purpose, so purposeful mission. And if there's one application, one response that I hope to show you today is in verse eight. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. Having been given a vision of how holy God is, how glorious he is, having, been see having seen how unclean and unworthy Isaiah is, how gracious God is in having his sins atoned for, Isaiah's immediate response 
to the need of having someone sent is an eager, here am I, send me. Send me. In fact, if you look at it, there's a pattern in all of Scripture. There is a pattern here, a pattern repeated over and over again in history. It says, God appears, man quakes in terror, God forgives and heals, God sends. That is the pattern that we see. What this makes clear is that it's not enough to simply say, I'm going to live a holy life. I'm going to be holy in my behavior and in my conduct. That is true. You are to have a holy life. But it is also true that you have been sent on a mission. Your mission is very clear. Your mission is go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Your mission is seen in Romans 10. Verse 14 and 15, how then will they call on him whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? Brothers and sisters, if you've seen how glorious God is, if you've seen the sovereign king, if you've understood how unholy and unrighteous and unclean you are and what it means to have your sins forgiven, if you've experienced the infinite grace and mercy and kindness of God in forgiving your sins through the blood of Christ, if you know these things, then your mission is to tell others. Your mission is to let others know. You realize that just as you are now seen before God as righteous, you can now come before a throne of grace. There are those here who will face God as their judge, as their holy judge if they were to die in their sins. Or as one man said, hell is truth known too late. Hell is truth known too late. And so, brothers and sisters, you have the knowledge of God's holiness, of Christ's righteousness that covers every sin, that covers you so you are now seen as righteous before God. And you have the joy of being able to live a life of worship and love to your heavenly Father. If you have this, your mission is to tell others of that. And this begins in the home. It begins in the home. Parents, do you make the salvation of your children your priority, your greatest priority? Fathers, do you make family devotion a priority that you want to have those daily devotion times because you want your children to know God? Young man, young woman, do you make it a priority to share the gospel at school, at work? And to each of you, do you make it a priority to continually share the gospel to your loved ones, to those who have mocked you, scorned you, don't want to listen to you, don't want nothing to do with the gospel? Do you keep trying to share with them? Do you make that a priority because you care about their soul? You care about what's going to happen to them if they were to stand before God? And maybe you're thinking, well, I've tried to share the gospel for years, for decades. They're not listening. Brothers and sisters, your goal is not to save them. Your goal is to show them Christ and pray that God will save them. That is your mission. That is what you are called to do. The same is true for you as it was for Isaiah. Even though... I Judah and Israel never listened to Isaiah. He still went to them. So the same is true. I mentioned earlier, I, my prayer is that I would, Lord willing, be sent to Japan. And if you don't know this about Japan, Japan is actually one of the largest unreached people groups. Of evangelical Christianity, they are roughly about 0.2% Christians there. 
And I was there in December. I did some sightseeing. I, I, you know, it wasn't really vacation, but I got to do some sightseeing. The, the saints, the believers that were there, they wanted to take me out. We went to Shibuya. And if you know anything about Shibuya, there's this really cool crossing there where hundreds and upon hundreds of people are crossing every moment, like every minute. And I got to experience that. I did the whole walk through, and it was amazing. And you know what went through my mind as I was doing this and understanding there's only 0.2% Christianity? My thought was, this must be what the broad road to destruction must look like. Matthew 7, verse 13, it says, the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. So as I'm doing this crossing, it's known as the scramble, it gave me a sobering picture that there are many still on that road, that broad road to destruction. And so the prayer is that, what are we going to do about it? What is your response when you think of who God is and what he's done for you? And so as I conclude, in looking at the holiness of God, Again, my hope and my prayer is that you would see these three things about the holiness of God, what it means to have a right view of His holiness. Second, that you would, what it takes for you to approach this holy God. And third, how you are to respond to His holiness. I admit in that seeing this, when we look at a picture of God in His holiness, I admit that this was humbling for me. It's humbling because it really shows you how unholy you are and how unholy I am. And perhaps that's you today. So I want to end with some words of comfort about this. And I'm going to end with the words from R.C. Sproul. He said, It's dangerous to assume that because a person is drawn to holiness in his study, that he is thereby a holy man. I am sure that the reason I have a deep hunger to learn of the holiness of God is precisely because I am not holy, but I have had just enough of a taste of the majesty of God to want more. I know what it means to be forgiven, to be a forgiven man, and what it means to be sent on a mission. My soul cries for more. My soul needs more. And so, brothers and sisters, how do you see God? How do you see him? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, it's humbling. Lord, we are unworthy, unworthy to come before you, unworthy to lift up our prayers, and yet because of Christ, we can. Because of what Christ has done, we can boldly approach a throne of grace in our times of need, in times of worship. And so, Lord, I pray for each person here Lord, would you do a work in their lives? For the unbeliever, I pray that you would show them who you are, that they would see how holy you are and that they have sinned against you. Would you save, Lord? And for the believer, I pray that this would motivate them to live for Christ even more, to have a love, a deeper love for him. So, Father, I pray that you would do that in Christ's name. Amen.